Okay, we'll wait a couple. <laughs> thank you. We'll wait a couple minutes here. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, bear with us for a couple more minutes as we wait for everyone to join us today. All right, let's go ahead and get started. And we have, we're gonna have a few more people joining us tonight as we, um, as we begin our intro, but let's go ahead and get started. And thank you um, everybody so much for tuning in tonight for this program. We are so delighted to have you with us this evening. My name is Amy Ellison and I'm the exhibition curator at the Los Altos History Museum. The Los Altos History, History Museum respectfully acknowledges the Muwekma Ohlone people on whose ancestral lands the museum sits. The Muwekma people have stewarded this land throughout the generations, and their historical relationship with the land continues to this day. Tonight's webinar, Gardening with Native Plants, which we are so thrilled to be hosting with Grassroots Ecology, um, is being offered in connection with our current exhibition, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. The exhibition features the stunning photography of Rob Badger and Nita Winter, and it's on display in our main gallery through July 11th. We are currently open to the public Friday through Sundays from 12 to four with safety protocols in place. And so I really hope that you'll be able to stop by soon and check out that exhibit. Uh, we are able to offer free admission to exhibitions like Beauty and the Beast, free programs like this webinar um, because of our members and our donors. If you would like to become a museum member, please visit our website at, los, at losaltoshistory.org and learn about the perks and benefits that come with your membership. So before I introduce our friends from Grassroots Ecology, just a couple of really quick housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. So if you would like to watch it again, or you wanna pass it along to a friend who wasn't able to attend tonight, um, the recording should be available on our website tomorrow um, probably tomorrow afternoon. So please keep checking back on our website um, so you can see this, this program and recordings of other programs that we've offered uh, throughout the last year. And I also wanna encourage people to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to write in questions and comments throughout the talk. Um, you don't have to, um, to worry about uh, waiting until the end to submit your questions. Um, go ahead and throw them in there whenever you think of them. And we will have time at the end of the talk tonight um, to, to, um, for a Q&A session. So Deanna will be able to answer your questions. So without any further ado, um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our first speaker today, Valerie Lee. Val is a project manager at Grassroots Ecology, leading stewardship projects and restoring balance to ecosystems in Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. In her time at Grassroots Ecology, she has facilitated field trips, guided walks, community building events, and habitat restoration work days for a variety of participants. Additionally, she's on the Internal Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Steering Committee, supporting Grassroots Ecology's capacity in expanding its social and educational impact 
in South Bay and Peninsula communities. So Val, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you um, uh, open things up. Thanks, baby. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me start off by saying myself how thankful I am for all of you for tuning in to the talk today. I know online workshops are definitely really plentiful nowadays. So um, I just want to say thank you for your trust and, of course, your most precious resource that you have right now, your time and your attention. Um, just thank you so much for being here. Um, I already know because you're here from the things we've seen in chat, even names that I know from the attendee list, that you're a kindred spirit. So it's just really great to be here in community with all of you. Before I jump into it all, I also want to start by saying that Wherever we're all logging in from, we are on unceded indigenous people's land. In what is now known as Los Altos, a wilderness that used to host species as big as grizzly bears, we acknowledge the fact that settler, co settler colonization has destroyed traditional livelihoods for the Muekma Ohlone tribe that took tens of thousands of years to develop. The loss of this biased community's close-knit relationship with the land has a multitude of negative effects to all of our livelihoods. Nevertheless, we hold spaces like these to acknowledge not only the lawful genocide and cultural suppression, but also recognize the resilience and power that Indigenous communities hold in maintaining strong membership of our society today. They're still here, and their culture is still vibrant. So my name is Valerie. I'll be moderating today's question and answer at the end of Deanna's talk, as well as introducing us to right now and explaining how exactly I was so lucky to be given this immense pleasure of speaking to you all. Uh, Deanna and I are both proud employees of the local nonprofit Grassroots Ecology. Grassroots Ecology's philosophy around environmental education and community stewardship and public open spaces has been in formation in the South Bay area and peninsula for about 50 years, dating back to 1970. You've heard of or even been a part of the Peninsula Conservation Center Foundation, Bay Area Action, Terra, which is a wonderful organization that is still in existence doing great work as we speak. If you've heard of all these different entities and you're not quite sure about some of my words, I'll sound to you, Deanna. You're going in and out a little teeny bit. Okay, that sounds uncomfortable. I'm um, not really sure what to do. Give me a second. I'll try to hook myself up to some speakers so that might work better. How do I sound now? A little bit better. Okay. Nope. Oh, well, if it's better, we'll, we'll try. No? Not good? A little echoey. I think yeah. the other way was better. The other way was better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. That's a really big bummer. Um, wish we had had that time to figure that out, but thanks everybody for your patience. Maybe I'll go a little bit slower. Maybe you can, can you tell I'm excited? <laughs> Maybe stuff will come out a bit smoother if it's muffled nevertheless. So what I was saying was about grassroots ecology's origin. So if you've heard of, you know, the Peninsula Conservation Center Foundation, Bay Area Action, Terra all of these different entities, and you're not quite sure about how they intersect with grassroots ecology, you're not alone. Um, it's been a rich, albeit very confusing, history of collaboration and growth, but the basics are that they are our predecessors, and we couldn't be us without them. So back in 2016 was when grassroots ecology became its own entity, so it's to focus more energy on community land stewardship. 
And it was in 2016 that I became an entry level restoration specialist for Redwood Grove Nature Preserve in Los Altos, as well as the three Los Altos Hills open spaces, specifically focused at Burn Preserve. Nearly five years later of community outreach, education, and pushing forward habitat restoration in that adorable transplanted grove of redwood trees at Redwood Grove and the awe-inspiring and expansive rolling oak savanna that is Burn Preserve. I'm now the project manager for these sites and the communities I was so fortunate to start out on. The work we do at Grafted Ecology and all of the open spaces that we work at is really closely tied to volunteerism. Since we started our partnership with the city of Los Altos in, in 2009 and the town of Los Altos Hills in 2014 to steward their land with their constituents, we have volunteers coming from across the entire Bay Area to spend their precious time and energy to restore ecosystem functioning at these designated open spaces. And despite how important it is to restore these rich expanses of diversity in really conserved corners of the world, there's a lot of potential, accessibility, and a really robust argument and value in the concept of developing really rich pockets of diversity in fully developed lands as well. Like, you know, maybe planting native plants in your yard. So neighborhoods, you know, to me are habitats that literally bridge the gap between the open spaces. And we provide the hope in them that we can save ourselves from ecosystem collapse. So this brings me to finally introduce our speaker for today, Deanna Giuliano. What I have to say to introduce this person will never do her justice, honestly. Her formal title is Nursery Director and Botanical Consultant at Grassroots Ecology. And what that requires, amongst many other things, is extraordinarily specific knowledge around watershed-specific seed collection, expert guidance in repopulating degraded restoration areas across many different microbiomes, high-level organization and communication, not only within our 20-plus restoration sites, but across large-scale projects in the Bay Area led by our community partners, like Valley Water and Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. And finally, a huge part of what Deanna does to better our world is continued education engagement. Our volunteers, interns, and amazing neighbors like all of you, folks see, seeking to respond to the urgent need to restore habitat by adding native plants to their own corners of the world. Deanna is also really fun to be around, and she's always super kind and encouraging. She's a great person who I and all of staff really look up to and hope for a sign time with, so as to optimize all of her incredible knowledge and good energy. So, very easy to say, we're in great hands today with our talk. So, without further ado, Deanna. Yeah. Wow, thank you. That's pretty amazing. Hopefully, I can uh, live up to all those expectations. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to kind of just talk about gardening with native plants. I do focus a lot on the local watersheds. Um, so um, we'll just get started. I'll just give a brief um, overview of a few things. And like everyone else, I want to, let's see, here we go. How do I make this? Whoa. I also want to um, just remind us all the, that California's indigenous peoples have long had an intimate knowledge of the native plants and the Californian landscape was actively managed by the indigenous peoples for all their livelihood from food, medicine, shelter, fuel, fiber, diet, and ceremony. So my outline today, I'm just going to give a brief little background of where um, my education comes from, uh, a little history of our nursery, um, and I'm going to kind of go into um, why we want to use local natives. Um, I'll go into a little bit about plant communities, mostly macro plant communities, and then um, how to go about species selection. 
And then I'll just show um, a little bit about our updated grassroots ecology um, native plant book. Um, and then we'll go into questions. So um, I was one of those um, people that had a family first and then decided to go back to school. Um, I got my AS in horticulture from Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz and I focused on crop production. I thought I wanted to be an organic farmer. Um, then I did a special study on um, Santa Cruz's native plant habitats and I was hooked. I bought my first Jepson manual and I changed my direction to um, go to uh, transfer to UCSC in Santa Cruz and I studied environmental studies combined with biology and focused on plant ecology. <clears throat> While a student there, I was lucky enough to be a work study student at the Arboretum. And I was mentored by the director there, uh, Brett Hall, where I learned a lot about propagation of our natives. Um, and we'd get to go on a lot of trips with him to the Big Sur back country and in Santa Cruz. Um, I then was, uh, graduated in 2003. I was hired on to then Actera's project, uh, the San Francisco Watershed Council. And I was very part-time at the nursery and part-time restoration technician at El Palo Alto Park and all the San Francisco sites. Um, I also was part-time uh, for a uh, for-profit here in Santa Cruz. Central Coast Wilds, and I was their seed collector and propagator. Um, I then became um, full-time with uh, then Actera, 2005, the nursery manager, and then in 2015, I became the nursery director. So the nursery's history. The nursery started in um, a, uh, staff members backyard because they couldn't find local watershed plants for our um, sites along San Francisco Creek and Arastradero. Um, when I came on in the fall of um, 2003, the nursery was behind a uh, benefactor's house in Atherton. Um, <clears throat> the house was being sold and we um, scrambled to find a place to move the nursery which was quite small at that time. Um, we did look at a few sites and we were lucky enough to have a partnership with the city of Palo Alto and we moved the nursery up to Foothills Park in that winter of 2003 with nothing there. <laughs> um, we were able to uh, build a small um, office and we had one large shade house. And um, from then we have grown abundantly. Um, and this is what nursery kind of looks like today, just um, the front office. Um, what do we do? Well, 65% of the plants we grow are for our internal projects. Um, like Val mentioned, we have 20 sites and um, we do a lot of volunteer work with removing invasives and then replanting with um, local watershed specific natives. 20% um, of what, what I, we grow at the nursery is contract grow with public agencies and biological consultants. And then about 15% I grow for um, local landscapers and residents. And as some of you might know, this last year with COVID, we used to do uh, plant sales with the California Native Plant Society Santa Clara chapter at Hidden Villa twice a year. And because of COVID, um, we weren't having plant sales, so we decided to do online sales now. So uh, that's been really great for us because um, we can never bring all our plants to the plant sale. So now people get to choose from the eclectic, um, inventory we have. Um, like I said, about 90% of what we grow is um, wild collected for me or the interns or staff. And um, it's all <clears throat> collected um, 
watershed specific. I keep detailed records of all the watersheds and areas that I collect in. Um, I have a database for that with all that information and then everything's stored there in the nursery. And then before we propagate, we um, clean the seeds. We also do some seed enhancement for some of our partners like Mid Peninsula Open Space Preserve. Um, they have some rare, um, locally rare and rare plants that they would like to enhance. These are for the Mount Aminum project. And so these are seeds I collect out at Aminum and then I seed enhance them. I grow them out. These are annuals at the nursery and I'm able to collect a lot more seed in the nursery because sometimes timing it is a bit tricky. And then this is, uh, if any of you've been up to the top garden that was planted um, by all the plants we grew, collected and grew um, from Mount Aminum. If you haven't been there, I highly um, encourage you to go check it out. It's a very special place. And it was a very special place for the native peoples. Um, and they do have a, a nice circle up at the top there for ceremonies. So why would you want to plant with uh, California natives in your garden? Well, it definitely creates a more sustainable, well-adapted California garden. Um, we live in a, a Mediterranean climate. We have dry summers and wet winters. Um, so these plants have really adapted and um, do really well with, with our climates. Um, you also, it helps preserve and conserve water. Um, the water quality in our watersheds is preserved. They need less water than your traditional lawns and non-native annuals. And most of the native shrubs and trees require no supplemental water once established. Now, this can take sometimes up three to five years for some of our species, just because they really need to get their root systems established in order to feel like they can start growing. Um, it's definitely lower maintenance. Um, you get minimal disease and insects problems. There's fewer weeds once you get the natives established and you don't need to fertilize because they're used to this soils. Um, uh, some things definitely need some fall pruning, um, but a lot of that could be aesthetics or it just in, helps encourages um, different growth too. Um, and then it creates a healthy habitat for our wildlife. So landscaping with native plants increases the biodiversity. Um, like Val said, with our many projects, we have many different kind of micro habitats in our different projects, but we always start out with a very diverse plant palette to see how things are going to um, do in our different sites. And we find that the more diverse palettes we use, we definitely get a greater number of diversity of insects, which in turn will support more birds and insect eating animals. Um, so it's really important. We grow everything from annuals to trees. And when we do our restoration projects, we always incorporate um, as many species as possible. I think the nursery grows at least 200 species. Um, we don't always have those available all the time, but um, definitely pretty close. Um, and also, um, the insects have genetically adapted to our local flora, and um, the plants have adapted to the local climate, soils, and topography. Uh, and your native backyard plantings will provide island corridors between these natural areas. And I wanted to just show you some fun little pictures. Um, these are actually taken at the nursery. Every year we have junco, juncos um, nesting and laying eggs in the nursery pots. And um, 
this was in some holodiscus, which is ocean spray. And um, this year they laid them in the false lily of the valleys. And uh, they're about this, this stage right now. Um, they hatched about a week ago. It's pretty fun to walk, see. Um, we get lots of great dragonflies. This is a take, all these are taken at the nursery on some yarrow. Um, a little damselfly on some horsetail. We get a lot of calcidin checker spot caterpillars on our um, bee plants. They actually host, um, they host on there, they lay the eggs and then the caterpillars just munch them down and um, get larger and then they pupate and become butterflies. Um, again, Here's some calcidin checker spot on the California poppy. And um, a nice bombus bumblebee on the Yerba Santa. And then a nice skipper on the Buckeye. So now I'm gonna kind of go into um, the plant communities. And like I said before, I'm gonna kind of go over more of the macro plant communities. And you can kind of think of your yards as um, little micro um, habitats within these macro habitats. Um, and you can incorporate these different natives that are adapted for these different areas in your yard. So if you think of coastal areas, they're usually dominated by low growing shrubs and perennials because they get lots of wind usually. Um, they get sun and some fog. Um, so they're found along the cooler coastal areas and their soils are usually very sandy and well drained. Then we get into our grassland areas, which are dominated by native bunch grasses and wildflowers. And within those, you get oak savannas, which will have valley oaks or blue oaks, depending on where you are. Um, usually up against these, both these areas, you'll get chaparral. Um, and this type of vegetation is where all the species have adapted for really hot, dry environments and pretty rocky soils. Um, and they're usually fire adapted um, environs. Um, oak woodland is of course dominated by oak species with a nice understory of shrubs and a, a variety of herbaceous plants. And within the, the woodlands, you get riparian areas, which are dominated by willows, sedges and um, different shrubs like dogwoods. And then of course we have mixed evergreen, which are dominated by um, your hardwood evergreens like madrones and bays and um, dug firs. So now I'm gonna kind of go into each one and um, just choose a few uh, species to kind of talk a little bit about. Um, so this is a Rigeron glaucus. This is a great border plant. Um, it actually will do quite, even though it says coastal, they do quite well on the east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains also. Um, they will flower um, almost year round. It's pretty amazing. You can prune them back, cut, deadhead them and you'll actually get them to keep flowering. I've seen them flowering on the coast here in, in the winter time. It's pretty amazing. Um, the baccarus that grows on the coast is a very low growing one. And um, it's pretty amazing. I think baccarus, all the coyote brushes have like over 200 species of native insects that actually use it. Um, it's great habitat plant too for um, smaller birds that like to kind of have um, an area to hide in, um, especially like the thrushes and um, quail. Um, 
I definitely see lots of native bees on the bacchus when it's flowering. Buckwheats. Buckwheats are a favorite of our native um, bees. Uh, they will just, it's amazing how many species of bees you'll actually see on these um, when they're in flower. This is the coastal one, which has really beautiful foliage. Um, and this one flowers, uh, you know, spring into early summer. Um, again, you could probably deadhead this back and get it to flower a couple times a year. And then, of course, we get our beach strawberry, Fragaria chiluensis. Um, and it does make fruit. It's not as sweet as our woodland strawberry, but it is still really good um, food for different birds. Um, and Facilia californica is a, um, this is the coastal one on the east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. We kind of get the Facilia imbricata with a white flower. And the bees are just love this flower. They're all over it. And it flowers very early. So I would say it could even start flowering in uh, March. So kind of uh, late winter, early spring flower. Then we kind of get into our grasslands. And um, around our area, we, we get a lot of serpentine. And so you get a lot of grasslands that are um, with annual and perennial wildflowers. So you get lupins and poppies and different types of bulbs. Um, and those are all like bees and butterflies, just love them. So some of the species you might find kind of in grasslands is yarrow. And that one is flowers in spring. And that's another one that you can sometimes deadhead and get to um, flower a few times a year. Uh, bees and butterflies love this plant. Um, our California aster and our California goldenrod are some of our late bloomers, which is really great because there's not a lot that flowers in the fall. And these two start in the summer and go through fall. Um, so it's a great source of nectar for bees and butterflies. And a great seed source for uh, birds like juncos and um, little seed eaters. And then uh, blue-eyed grass is another great um, addition to the garden. Um, it's really easy once you get it going, you can divide them in the fall and move them around your yard because they just kind of keep growing into a larger, um, they're rhizominous, but they don't move around too much. They just kind of make a lot of um, new plants. Uh, and of course, we can't forget grasses, our native grass, the stipa pulchra. And uh, one of my favorites is Melica californica. It's a really beautiful grass that kind of adds some nice depth in a garden. These are great um, seed sources for uh, different birds for food which is um, a nice addition to the garden. They flower now, kind of late spring, and then they'll be seeding within the next month. Then we kind of get into our chaparral. Uh, this is our one of our local manzanitas. It's what they call a burrow former, so that when fire comes, it'll actually re-sprout from its burrow. Um, most of the manzanitas, uh, if you think of, you've probably seen big berry manzanita, that is um, actually not a burl former. It's a cedar, they call it. And, um, but this one's more local, brittle leaf manzanita. These are great for the garden as a specimen plant, if you have a nice sunny area. And um, they flower in the winter time, which hardly anything flowers then. 
They're quite beautiful. They have bell-shaped flowers that the hummingbirds just love. And they you'll actually hear them kind of fighting um, over them because um, they're so territorial. And then they make this great little um, manzanita means ap little apple. And they actually are edible um, by us and birds and other critters. So um, this is a great plant to have if you've got the sun. Um, uh, Toyon is another great habitat plant. It flowers in the late fall and we get the berries in the winter time, which is great. The birds love them. And they used to call them, um, they call them uh, holly. And if you, anybody's heard the story about Hollywood got its name because the, in the hills of Hollywood, there was just like toyons everywhere. And that's kind of where the name came from actually. Um, and then our coffee berry is a really great evergreen shrub which we don't have a lot of evergreen shrubs. So um, these are um, kind of powerhouses in that realm. Um, as the uh, coffee berry is flowering, I've noticed it at the nursery right now, it's in full flower and it is just covered in native bees. I could probably pick out like at least 10 species of bees and bumblebees on it. They just love it. Um, and of course, it has great berries that the birds love to eat. Then we have uh, Epilobium canum or California fuchsia. That's another really great late flower. Um, and as you can see with that tubular flowers, um, really attracts the hummingbirds. They love the tubular flowers. Um, and it flowers in summer through fall. So it's really late. Um, Monardella violosa, our coyote mint, a favorite of bees and butterflies. It's flowering now, late spring. Um, buckwheats, like I said, are a favorite of bees and butterflies. And it starts to flower about now and can kind of go through part of summer. <clears throat> and it's great uh, seed source for um, critters. <clears throat> Another favorite is sticky monkey flower. And in the garden trade, there's lots of different um, hybrids and cultivars of this in many different colors. You can get um, purples, reds, um, apricot, orange. That's amazing all the different colors it comes in. Um, this is another one that does well by pruning. Um, they aren't very long lived, I would say three to five years. Um, and they do really well with kind of pruning pretty hard because they can get kind of rangy. Um, they are a favorite of butterflies and bees. And of course, all the salvias are um, uh, butterflies and bees. Um, it's a great um, shrub to kind of accent in a hot area. Then we get into the oak woodland, um, which are kind of, as you can see, a lot of these um, communities kind of are a mosaic and weave in and out of each other. You can kind of see grassland and the oak woodland kind of mixing here. The oaks actually have, I don't know, like probably 300 or more species that are associated with it. It's a very important habitat plant for all critters, insects, birds, uh, mammals, for food and um, shelter, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> Another one of my favorites for the wintertime flowering is the pink flowering currant, the Ribe sanguinium. Um, it flowers from, <clears throat> it can flower as early as November and flower through February. And it does have edible fruit. Again, it's got this great tubular flower for hummingbirds and bees also like it. Um, buckeyes are flowering right about now 
and then they'll have their nuts ready by um, fall. Um, a lot of people have said that they are poisonous to honeybees, but I have seen them, um, the native bees really do um, love this plant. And if you ever walk by one, you have to smell them. They're quite delicious. Um, ocean spray is another one of our great shrubs. I, I think it's underutilized. Um, it does really well in kind of dry shade and it just gets this beautiful spray of tiny flowers. It's in the rose family and it actually smells quite nice too. Um, it is also um, a nectar plant for bees and butterflies and flowers right about now. So spring into early summer. And then some of the smaller plants we get is uh, Hukura micrampa, which has just these really delicate flowers can kind of take that shady spot in your yard. Um, I have seen bees on this. The same with the uh, Yerba Buena. It's a nice ground cover that's evergreen for shady dry spot under oaks. And I've also seen bees um, pollinate them. Then throughout the uh, woodland areas, we get into kind of riparian areas. And um, big leaf maples, of course, are quite spectacular. Um, they get this really beautiful spring foliage. Um, they're kind of one of those trees that <clears throat> will get kind of California's fall colors, I call it. We also have poison oak that can get quite beautiful too, but you probably don't want that in your yard. But the oak, the oaks and the, uh, the deciduous oaks and the big leaf maples are quite beautiful. And we do have a few local dogwoods. We have the creek dogwood, the cornice cerisia, and the birds love to eat the berries. And we have. Um, <coughs> brown dogwood, Cornus glabrata. And then a real favorite of the robins, I have a robin, we have a huge Lanistra in Balucata at the nursery, and the robin just loves the berries. So I'm constantly seeing the robin on the twin berry. And they are pollinated also, the bees love it, and the hummingbirds, because it's got that nice tubular flower. Uh, another one in the rose family is the Physocarpus capitatus. It's another one that's evergreen pretty much, especially if it gets a little summer water. Um, uh, they are pollinated by bees and they flower right about now, late spring into summer. Um, currants, we have the golden current. This is one of our currants that actually can be in full sun. If it has a, a, if you kind of have a, a moisture area in your yard with full sun and it has these beautiful golden um, uh, berries that are edible. So they're great food source for birds and they are pollinated by um, bees. I definitely have seen bees on them. And then last, we get into our next mixed evergreen kind of hardwoods. Um, Arbutus menziesii, which I just think they're, they're a beautiful tree. They flower early spring. They're pollinated by bees and um, hummingbirds. They also have a tubular flower. They're in the same family as the manzanitas. And then they have these great, beautiful berries that the birds just love in the fall. Um, on the left, oh, it looks like I forgot the name, uh, Rubus uh, parviflorus thimbleberry, and they actually call them that because the berries look like a little thimble for sowing. They're quite delicious. If you can find them before the birds um, get them, they're pollinated by um, bees. And um, hazelnuts, the same thing. They're actually hard to get the nuts because the squirrels get to them before I usually do. 
Ceanothus thursiflorus, our California lilac, um, pollinated by bees and butterflies. And this is another one of those great kind of early, late winter, early sp spring flower. And columbines, of course, I have seen um, bees and hummingbirds on those. They make a great accent for a woodland garden, along with the um, redwood sorrel, which is evergreen and um, kind of moves around by rhizomes and kind of will create a carpet. And I'm sure if you've been to Redwood Grove, you've seen that we've slowly been establishing the redwood sorrel there. There was none there when we started working there um, due to they were kind of uh, blowing all the needles away and there was no nice duff and um, regeneration of the soil happening, which um, these plants really need. So I'm just gonna kind of go over some um, criteria for plant selection. Um, I kind of use this a little bit for our restoration areas, but I feel like it can be used in your, your own yard because you can look at your yard as, like I said, many different little micro habitats um, that you can create different um, spaces. So the first thing you want to do is kind of look at what you have there. You want to look at the type of soils, and you might have different types of soils in different parts of your yard. Um, same with the light. Um, are you gonna? Is there a full sunny spot? Is there part shade under an oak tree, or maybe a, a different type of evergreen tree? Um, what's the hydrology like? Are you on a hillside? Um, do you maybe have a wet uh, kind of swale area that might in the wintertime be a little moister where maybe um, something like milkweed might like to be um, and different to topography uh, features on your landscape. Um, sometimes it's nice to go out into the wild and kind of use it as a reference site to see um, kind of what what you would like to um, have in your yard. Um, and that goes along with the type of habitat you might want to emulate. And then of course, like all gardening, there's the personal aesthetics of kind of what you'd like to see in your yard. So when choosing the different species, um, say you choose some manzanitas, you want to kind of think about what they need in their natural habitats to determine how or where it would do well in your yard. Um, and then grouping the plants according to their needs. Um, so like manzanitas and um, California fuchsias and um, ceanothus, they all would do really well on a kind of a hot south facing slope or hot area in your yard with a well drained soil. Or you might think of an oak woodland kind of dry shade, um, different species that would do well under there, like um, hummingbird sage and um, the California aster or the goldenrod. They really love those um, dry shade. Um, gardens. Um, you also kind of want to think about um, foliage color and texture for aesthetics. Um, you, the plants only flower for a certain amount of the year, so you might think about how um, the colors of the different foliage uh, work together. And you want to kind of use the repetition of colors that weaves through your garden um, and will make kind of natural swaths of, of colors and it looks much more natural. I like to group things in odd numbers. And um, so I always go with three fives or sevens or whatever. And I like to kind of, uh, especially with the perennials and um, you really wanna kind of um, not just have one here and one maybe 10 feet away, 
you want to think about like how big they get at their maturity and put maybe three together so you kind of really can see them um, and they kind of um, jump out more instead of being like one single plant where with our larger shrubs like salvias you might just want like one or two together and then like manzanitas or something you're going to want like a specimen plant and then like create your garden around that plant. And then for creating habitat gardening, you really want to think about having a steady source of food year round. So that's either nectary, flowers, or fruit. So that's why um, you want to use a plant palette that has um, many different species and it's diverse because then you'll have flowering throughout the year. Um, so that's kind of why I talked about the different habitats a little bit and about flowering times, because that's really important um, to think about that when you're designing your garden for habitat. Um, it's also nice to have continuous layers of vegetation to attract different species of different niches, um, perching sites, brush piles, bare grounds, really important. A lot of our native bees um, actually are solitary um, uh, nesters and they, they live underground. Um, they need some bare ground or some of them also will use old beetle holes in um, trees or shrubs. And you need to have a water source. Um, that's around for um, them to come. Uh, I also like to um, prune in the fall, but I also let a lot of plants stay in um, seed and I don't prune it right away. And especially with like, I have some evening primrose at the, at the garden and it's fun to watch the birds come, the, Old finches and come and eat the seed right off the plant. It's really fun to watch. So I just wanted to kind of talk real fast. Um, we've been uh, redoing the lawn at Foothills Park for many years. And the first year we did it, they're like, sure, you can have this area. We can't even get the grass to grow here. And of course, if you've ever been to Foothills Park, you know there's tons of deer there and bunnies and you name it. So I was like, great, this is a challenge. So we sheet mulched it in the winter and uh, no, we sheet mulched it in the summer, sorry. And then we um, planted it in the winter. And this was the first uh, spring after that. Um, and this was the second spring after, um, and it really filled in. So I used really hardy natives that are uh, rhizominous, which means they spread underground. Um, and so like yarrows and different sedges. And then in the background, I kind of put some um, ribe sanguinium, the pink flowering currant. I also have some California asters in there things I knew that could kind of compete with weeds and could um, deal with the herbivory well. Um, just wanted to share, we have a, a volunteer that made all these really cool little native bee boxes for us. And if you can see, there are different size holes for the different species of native bees. And, um, the ones you see with a little bit of mud on them, that's actually, they've laid their eggs, they've put some food in there, and then they pack it with mud, um, and then they'll emerge the next spring. It's really fun to watch. Um, other fun things, if you don't have a lot of space, we took an old pallet, and I um, lined the back of it with some ground um, tarp and filled it with soil and we planted it with a bunch of fun things like uh, strawberries and yerba buena. I think I put some, a few deadlias in there. They've got the, um, the hookahs in there. It's, it's been really fun to watch that um, mature. Um, 
okay, so now I just wanted to talk about if any of you ever got our older book, we put out, I don't even know now, maybe 10 years ago, we finally got during COVID, had the time to revamp it, do some name changing and add some more um, uh, species and more description to the new book. Um, so we kind of have it set. So it uh, has annuals, an annual section, and it goes into the size, the flowering time, the type of habitat that it would traditionally grow in in the wild, the type of soil it wants. We used symbols for um, the water and exposure and different wildlife that like it and any um, special notes we wanted to add. Um, so then we also have, of course, herbaceous perennials and um, evergreen shrubs. It goes all the way from annuals to trees and they're all um, it's very organized. Um, it's really helpful, I feel, because it's um, just the basics that you kind of need. And then if you want to look up a plant more um, online to get more information, but it's a great starter. Um, we also have a bunch of lists in the back. Um, this one's for dry shade under oaks. And then we list them by their different annuals grasses, et cetera. Um, and then we also, this is new, we created the 40 easiest to garden plants. If you're a newbie and wanna try your hand at, at gardening with natives to bring in some local fauna, this is the list for you. And I guess we can go to questions now. Oh, and I do have a resource page at the back. That was awesome, Deanna. Thank you. Four minutes to spare. Nice. Good, because we have a lot of questions. How's my audio? Right. Any better? Yeah. OK. That cool. sounds good, Val. Thanks. Thanks everybody for all your patience earlier too. Um, okay, let's start with where do we get these things? How, can you give us some advice on how to source native plants? Um, well, most of these you can get from us because we have online sales now. And if you go to our website and then you go to um, the native, the nursery uh, part, page, it'll have online sales and I have our current inventory on there. And then you just email me what you want and then I get back to you. And I usually send a link with PayPal and then I set them out for you to pick up at the nursery. So it's pretty, it's been working really nicely. And Am I correct in finding the that this is the same place that I can access this magnificent book you're advertising? Yes, and I think the Los Altos History Museum has a few copies too. Amy told me in our talk before that they are sold out amazingly. Wow. So you have to come straight to the source. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to group everyone's questions together. So please just keep them rolling and we'll keep going through it. Um, so the book is awesome for, you know, if you want to find all of your, you know, figure it out yourself and, and piece things together and know your own yard best. But do you have any native contractors or designers that you would recommend if you didn't want to put in the legwork yourself? Yeah, there was, um, let me think. There's Aggie Kehoe. Um, I don't know what her... If you emailed me, I could probably send you her information. There's also California Nativescapes, Rebecca. She's really cool. She does a lot of stuff with the Amamutsun. Um, she's done stuff up at Castle Rock. Uh, she knows her natives and she, she does a lot of urban gardening. Yeah, California Nativescapes. Um, there used to be in, uh, what was, uh, 
Indigo, but she moved to Carmel, so she's not around. Um, yeah, those are a few I can think of right now. I think that means a lot. All the ones that are coming off the cuff, you know, those ones are well vetted and, and yeah. awesome. Um, okay, going back to our amazing nursery, what does watershed specific native mean? Okay, yeah, I didn't go into that too deeply, but in some of my talks I do, I just wasn't sure if I should go into that. So basically, um, if you look on a map, you'll kind of see how the mountains form watersheds and the watersheds flow into, on the east side of the Santa Cruz Mountains, they flow into the bay. So San Francisco watershed kind of starts up on Skyline. It goes through Portola Valley. It'll have some tributaries like Los Trancos Creek, which is in Foothills Park. And then it flows out at the bay, kind of near the baylands. Um, uh, in our area, let's see, Burn Preserve is adobe watershed, and that comes off of um, Page Mill too. Actually, you can hit three watersheds on Page Mill Road. You can hit the headwaters of Stevens Creek at the top near Skyline Ridge. Then you hit adobe to the south, and you hit San Francisco on the uh, north. Um, but a lot, you can um, actually probably go online and look up watersheds and kind of get a feel for them too. And so is what I do is when I'm out collecting is I collect this, the seeds in those watersheds and I keep track of those watersheds that I'm collecting them in. And then we try to use those watersheds for our different projects like Burn Preserve and Redwood Grove are in Adobe. So I try and source most of the material from Adobe watershed and some from maybe San Francisco. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, so my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that these watersheds are, you know, even though they're all in California, they have their own utmost amazing, resilient genetic gene, you know, mm -hmm. biome. And if we keep planting from that watershed back into that watershed, we can really support like resilience in our communities. But if we Correct. plant and say, you know, a, a, from Southern California, bring it up mm. to, you know, or even, you know, different watersheds that are right next to each other, it's just not as strong of a community and you're not supporting the most like the, the millennia of, of evolution that has evolved um, or yeah that can take place in a, an ecosystem like that. Correct, and a lot of watersheds don't even have the same species growing in them either. Right. They're very yeah. unique. Right. So that is a very interesting part about grassroots ecology is how scientific we get into wanting to replant out our restoration sites and our local communities with the same kind of watershed specific plants. Okay, what does seed enhancement mean? This is something from far early okay. in here. Okay, so seed enhancement. So I usually do seed enhancement for annuals. So annuals are plants that come up in the spring, flower and set seed and they're done, that's it. Um, so it's really hard sometimes to get out into the wild and collect some of these, these annuals at this time of year when it's so dry, they're, they're really hard. They look very different, you know, um, they're hard to find, they're really small. And so is what I do is I collect them in the wild and then I bring them to the nursery and I sow them in pots and I grow them up in pots to flower and fruit. And then I collect the seeds from the pots and then I give them back to um, midpin to put back out in at like Mount Umminum. They go back out into the wild. Cool, quite the operation you have up there, Deanna. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so talking about if we wanted to get some native plants from your nursery, is there a specific, I mean, I understand that if we go to the Grasses Ecology Nursery site, 
we can see the availability of different plants and species. But is there like a specific time that they're available, like depending on type or, you know, talking about seed enhancement, or are they all kind of placed out and available depending on their age and maturity? Yeah, so they are all available. Um, what I have on the inventory list is what is available and ready to go now um, at different sizes. Um, people are always welcome. If they're looking for something specific, we do uh, contract grow to plants for people. Cool. What would you, so say we got plants from your nursery, when would be the best time to be replanting an entire part of my yard with native plants? Do you have any advice around that? Yeah, so here. the best time to plant is when we get the rains, hopefully. Um, so we traditionally plant our projects all from November through February. And that's usually when it's the rainy season because the natives really want to get their roots established before they grow. We plant them in the winter when it's raining and then they get their roots established. Then when spring comes, they're able to support themselves and, and put on growth. Winter time, got it. And say you have the option between replanting your entire yard with seed or replanting with transplanted plants. Would you lean either direction? Would you go, you know, is there a, a balance that you might be able to fit? Yeah, there's definitely a balance. So um, seeding with trees and shrubs is really difficult. Yeah. Um, the only thing that, that might be okay to do is like acorns or buckeyes, something that has a very large net and can kind of take hold and grow pretty fast. Uh, another seed would be any annual seed you'd put out in the fall and that would come up. But otherwise you wanna start with plants and um, oh, and grasses. Some grasses can be like seeded too. But if you start with plants, I kind of call them your mother plants. And if you get those established, then you can start some of them might start moving around, especially some of the perennials like Phacelia. Um, they kind of seed everywhere and will start making um, new plants from that plant you started. But to just throw the seed out for some of those is really difficult to get them established. Because a lot of the birds, they're smart. They know, and they'll come munch all those yummy seeds up. <laughs> That's a great point. Okay. I think I've done my best at grouping all of them. Now I just have a lot of really wonderful, unique questions. So let's see how we can go through all of these. Do you have um, a suggestion? I think it's really beautiful to see how much you can just pull off the cuff of like, oh, we'll put a manzanita with a California fuchsia and you know, you'll discuss these things of how they shape it. So I think this is a really great opportunity to hear from Deanna about good natives for fire prone areas. <laughs> I had a feeling this was going to come up. <laughs> well, that's <also>, right. <sorry. laughs> yeah. Good natives. Well, there's, there's some real basics with gardening, um, urban gardening. You know, you got to have the buffer zone from your house. You know, that's huge. And thinking, thinking about fuel ladders, you know, how, how fire would move in the landscape, you know, so keeping things pruned up. So you can have things like manzanitas in your, in your yard. You just don't want to like a lot of uh, low branches that are kind of dead. That's why it's good to prune, um, not just aesthetically, but from the point of view of, um, fire prevention. Um, so that's a hard one. Um, I do know that the California Native Plant Society um, state, if you go on their website, they have amazing um, resources on 
fire landscaping. So I, I'm not even going to try and um, articulate it all because it's it that's a whole nother uh, talk, I feel like. Um, but I know they have a great resource that they put out a couple years ago. So I'm hearing there's definitely specificity, you know, you don't want something like really high oil content, but also it's a lot about how you're maintaining your landscape and making mm -hmm. sure that you're protecting the area around your home. Interesting, definitely a really good conversation to be had in California. So you talked a lot about, you know, how all of these plants have this amazing support basis for bees, butterflies, birds, um, all these charismatic insects. And I think I understand that as like the linkage from the ground to all of the other trophic levels, like bees, birds, butterflies, those are like really easy for us to notice. And we all know what they look like. So it's exciting when we see more of them, but it really is more of a metaphor around like support for all, <laughs> like a basis that if without this link to the insects, we don't have the link even further up to trophic levels like us, like humans. Um, so that's a really interesting conversation around the impact that native plants have on um, insects. But what kind of impact do drought and bee scarcity have on native plants? Hmm. Interview question. <laughs> bee, bee scarcity, like no bees around, like honeybees or just bees in general? I think bees in general. Let's go with that. Okay. So the question is how, what do natives do, do for that? The um, impact that our climate changing, the change, like the loss and extinction of all these insects. Right. I think it's, I think the biggest thing is um, for urban landscaping with natives is you're creating corridors. And that's, I think the biggest, biggest um, contribution you people can do because um, landscapes are so fragmented but um, if you think about it, like houses can be like these corridors, you know, they're gardens. I see it. I, I live in Santa Cruz and I actually, I see mo monarchs in my backyard, you know, so like they're definitely corridors for, um, for all the insects. So I think it's really great. And then a really great book that I put in the resource was Douglas Ptolemy's um, Bringing Nature Home, I think it's called, and it's in my resources. And that is just a great book. He's on the East Coast, but he has just great, um, he's done a lot of this nurturing nature in your own backyards, and he's just seen the diversity of birds and insects incredibly exponentially go up, so. Oh, this was a question actually. Could you flip your slides so that people could see those resources? Yes. Thank you. Um, so in addition to all the wonderful insects that we'll get, um, if I plant a lot of native plants in my yard, will I get a really dramatic increase of lizards living there too? Oh, I bet. Because I have a lot of lizards at the nursery because there's lots of food for them. I have lots of tree frogs too. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Talk about those higher trophic levels, right? And yeah. The linkages all throughout. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our book, you talked about how grassroots ecology has this incredible book that exemplifies plant palettes for different plant communities. Does it specify like a city or a county that these associate with? Or are they more, you know, is this plant community descriptor more around conditions within someone's yard? Um, well, we focused on species in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we made it kind of regional instead of watershed specific. So all the plants and the habitats we talk about are kind of in that region. 
Um, yeah, if that helps. But some of those species are in other, you know, more Southern Cal or more Northern, like, but we just tried to focus more on the San Francisco Bay Area since we're so local. Oh, I should have grouped this one with our insects, but would you recommend, or do you think it's more environmentally preferable to landscape with native plants as opposed to other Mediterranean climate plants like that are drought tolerant, like lavender? Well, I mean, you can definitely um, plant with natives and other Mediterranean type plants together because they kind of like, uh, they can, take the same situations and you know it's nice to have lavender for like bouquets and I, I garden the same way at home I have like you know my pretty stuff like dahlias I love dahlias right um, but I also have like lots of natives and they all can really coexist it doesn't have to be one or the other um, because the lavenders definitely bring a lot of bees too uh, so there are a lot of Mediterranean plants that um, I don't I don't think it has to be a hard fast this or that, but I think it's a, a mesh of of just bringing in um, pollinators and making habitat. That's a great point. I think that's a really beautiful part about getting to curate our little corners of the world is making it fulfilling and sustainable for the individual as well. I mean, that's a, a theme you could take <laughs> and any, any kind of movement that you wanna continue forward, social justice, environmental, habitat restoration, it needs to definitely support some internal um, fulfillment first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question, we, this kind of loops back, Laura had a question about including some Southern California natives that would be happy here as climate change progresses. We talked about it a bit already in watershed specific seed, but let me take a stab at it. Um, I don't think it would be wise to, to include some Southern California native because we're not going to be the best judge of what climate change is, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a really basic understanding of climate change in that unexpected things happen. Um, and I do think that we should trust our genetic makeup within the watershed that we already are in to be able to adapt to whatever changes occur with climate change. So making the big leap from bringing something from Southern California up to the Bay Area because we think that it'll go this kind of direction, it may, but it also may have a big detriment to the habitat like pro providing that instead a Bay Area grass would be able to provide as opposed to the relationship between a Southern California grass and um, all the different insects in the Bay Area. Yeah, and I also want to say that, you know, think of annual seeds. They're making and they're changing with the environment every year, every year. And then perennials, they're making seed every year. They are adjusting and evolving every year with every progeny. So I feel like the plants know way better than us on how to uh, evolve and, and deal because they've been doing it forever. So I just trust them. <laughs> um, could you repeat those landscaping sources? I think there were two to three or so. And in that also answer if there are any consulting services that we offer to help create like a plant palette or a space. Yeah, yeah anything like that. Yes, I do. I, I have um, a woman I've been working with in the Los Altos Hills for like 10 years or more, and her yard is amazing. So yes, um, we do consult, and you can just email me. Uh, my email, I should have put it on there. It's just nursery at grassrootsecology.org. Because um, I was like, I don't want a personal email and the nursery email. I just have one email. Um, and then the sources again was um, California Native Scapes, I think is what Rebecca's um, uh, 
landscaping businesses, California native scapes, I'm pretty sure. And then the other person was Aggie Kehoe and it's K-E-H-O-E. -E. And I don't know if she has a, uh, it just might be Aggie Kehoe design, but if you email me, I could, I could give you her contact. A manzanita question for a manzanita lover. Hmm. How big does the brittle leaf manzanita grow? And is it fast or slow? It is, gets to be tree size in maturity. Um, they can be over 15 feet tall. Um, they tend to be on the edge of kind of um, chaparral and uh, woodland. So they, they don't have to be completely out in the hot. Um, they are not the fastest. They'll take a good three winters to get their roots established and then they'll start growing. But there are some manzanitas that are a little faster. Um, like uh, Arctostaphylus andersonii is the Ben Lomond um, manzanita. I grow that one um, and that one can get tree size too, but you can also prune them. You just kind of have to um, know when to prune and not prune too big of branches to kind of get them to grow the way you want them to look. That is certainly the secret to <laughs> managing your own personal landscape and making sure that it's aesthetically pleasing, but also um, uh, serves the habitat. Deanna is a master pruner. She's always just telling me to cut things off and don't worry about it, it's gonna be fine. But of course that confidence grows with so many years of being a naturalist and knowing exactly when and how. Okay, a few more pretty specific questions, but we are coming up on um, just nine minutes left together. So that's exciting. That happened fast. Um, Heather has a coyote brush that's male, but she doesn't, she can't get her own seedlings for any female coyote brushes. Do we at Grassroots Ecology sell female coyote brush? Mm. I have taken cuttings and um, I do not have any females right now. Um, but that is something that can be done. <laughs> Another pretty specific question about milkweeds. Um, is there any advice that you have on how all of us could help with monarchs and the declining population? Um, yeah, I mean, milkweeds do pretty well in most yards. We have um, quite a big patch at the nursery. I planted one plant and uh, it's huge. It's gotta be what, it's in this bed that's about 15 by five feet or something. It's, and then in the winter it just goes dormant and I cut it back. But our naked stem buckwheat is a little bit, that's the speciosa, which is the showy milkweed. Um, and then our more local one is the naked stem buckwheat. But if you kind of have an area in your yard, even a, um, a, a bed that, you know, you could maybe, they, they like a fair amount of moisture in the winter and spring. They, they tend to grow in swelly areas that get seasonally really wet and then slowly dry out or a high water table area in your yard or maybe an area that um, you have um, some drainage from the rain. Um, they like a fair amount of sun, um, if that's helpful. But um, yeah, I think planting milkweeds is a great idea, local milkweeds. That's great to hear you start out by saying, I think it could work in any yard. <laughs> That's really exciting, <laughs> especially, you know, considering we don't, anyway, um, we have water sources. That's what I was going to get to. You know, it's just this idea that it's not fully um, to the wilds of what ends up happening. Um, but of course you want to adapt closely to it. 
Mm -hmm. um, talking about sunny areas, do you have any suggestions for a novice of like what you would plant that's easy to grow and has some ornamental flowers? Salvias, salvias, all salvias are really easy to grow. Um, they grow fast and they look beautiful. You can deadhead them and get them to keep flowering. You can use them in, um, you know, cuttings for flowers in a vase. Um, I also think that the, um, the Epilobium canum is a really great one. The California fuchsia, it's more of like a ground cover, but that is really great. Easy, it moves around. So yeah, those are some easy ones to start with. Those have really cool colored like uh, leaves as well. Not only do they have ornamental flowers, but sometimes they're um, scented or, you know, mm -hmm. have like this silvery grayness to them. So really beautiful aesthetics. And it's easy to spread, cute red flat, why, why not? <laughs> I'm convinced. Okay, so how about for those that aren't novices? Um, what if you planted something and it doesn't seem like they really like it there? Um, do you recommend moving them if they're not happy or does it matter, you know, around the kind of roots that they have to determine something like that? Yeah, it kind of depends on the species too. Like I would say some plants are more persnickety when you move them and their root systems are more delicate. Um, things like manzanitas, those are really tricky. Um, Ceanothus, I feel like are also a little persnickety. Um, if it's pretty well established, you know, I would say it's kind of tricky. But if it's maybe a smaller perennial or something, I think it's easily done. And you basically just kind of want to um, use a nice shovel and go out from where the root ball would be. Like say your root ball's here, you want to go out and, and work the shovel around it and try and get that whole root ball to move together. And then you're, you're not disturbing the roots as much. It is good to know that there are some definitely be really careful if you're gonna attempt these species, but otherwise, you know, if, if it's not of these like certain 10 or so <laughs> only, um, then maybe you can make an attempt and, and give it a better life. So good luck mm -hmm. with that. <laughs> um, okay, another one, I think this may be our last one. If you have any others, you can drop it into the chat, but we might not be able to get to it. Um, a person that lives uh, near the History Museum and has really heavy clay soil. What kind of habitat would you describe that as or any recommendations on what to do? <laughs> yeah, actually a lot of um, the soils around, around that area are heavy clay. And there actually are quite a bit of plants that will do well. It depends, I mean, like, if, if it's shady or sunny, so shady, I would say um, things like the Ribe sanguinium, the pink flowering currant, the holodiscus, those all do really well. Um, more sunny, um, I think the King's Mountain Manzanita is one that actually will do okay with, with heavier soils. I think the Crustacea, the Arctostaphylos Crustacea will too. I'm trying to think. I feel like we might have a list in the book, but um, a lot of what we grow does very well in that type of soil because it's actually adapted, and those are the kind of soils we have around there. Nice. You, can, you have it at burn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure do. Lots of extra nutrients added to that soil, too, yeah. though, <laughs> with all the horses. Okay, I think that is it. Thanks so much, Deanna. Um, I just have, you know, a few parting words around, I have this other question of the difference and the similarities between grassroots ecology and Peninsula Open Space Trust. Um, Peninsula Open Space Trust is a conservation organization seeking to, um, <laughs> I, I was about to like launch into a way that I really, I don't really talk about them. I talk about grassroots ecology all the time. They, they conserve land. Um, they buy and make sure that land is, is never going to be developed moving forward. 
Grasses Ecology does not purchase any land. All the land that we work on is belongs to all of us. The community, the public belongs to different municipalities. And um, post, like, so the, you know, it would be like post separates some land so it never gets developed. And then now as a result of this conserved land, grassroots ecology comes in with volunteers to restore that environment there and um, re remove any invasive species. Hopefully that made more sense than it felt. Um, just a few last words from me. Um, Grasses Ecology exists for people like you to love and care for our open spaces. And if there's one thing that I want you all to noodle on leaving from this talk, it's the fact that nature can only thrive with human impact. We've all been fed this interesting um, note about conservation by John Muir that nature and people should be always separate. And that is just a very detrimental belief. So I want you all to noodle on that, that we, it's a really deadly misconception and that I also want you to think about the fact that one garden transformation, just one, just yours, can support this really urgent need we all have to reconnect our fragmented habitats for all of these essential species. So appreciate your time. Amy, you wanna close us out? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Deanna, for that amazing talk. So many good tips. And Val, thank you so much to um, Grassroots Ecology. Thank you to, to your whole team for what you do and for helping us out with this program. And thanks to all of you in attendance tonight. Um, thank you for giving us your time and tuning in. Um, and I really hope that you will check out the exhibit. Um, uh, we are open from Friday, Friday to Sunday, 12 to 4. Um, the exhibit is open through July 11th. And please also sign up for our next program. It's coming up on June 24th. And we are co-hosting a panel with Greentown Los Altos. So please um, register on our website for that event. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great panel um, of, of local people who... Um, are going to tell us how we can go more green in our in our little town. So please tune in for that. And thank you again. And um, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>